have a new sound system. We have subwoofers that people are envying us who do rap music full time. And we've got, um, we're trying to learn how to use the soundboard. And my voice is really not good this week. I think it's the fires from Canada. No offense to Canada there, Toby. But um, I think that um, I'm trying to get, so I'm not hearing my own breath in my, is that better a little bit? We're trying to work with this, so if you can't hear, just be patient. We're working on it all right. Part of it is me running out of air right now, but I need to see the doctor this week. I'm going to try to get an appointment this week to see her, so hopefully this will be short-lived. But, you know, last week I said when we read this long lesson from the Acts of the Apostles that I always like to have a gospel lesson to go with it. Last week it was Jesus and the speaking to the disciples in the call to worship, and today he's speaking to the disciples from the book of Acts, because Leander Keck, who was one of the founders of the Disciple Bible Study, used to call the Acts of the Apostles the Gospel of the Holy Spirit. And let me read to you again what, what Jesus said to his disciples then, which applies to his disciples now. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. You will be my witnesses when you will receive power from the Holy Spirit. Now, what is it that Peter says in the beginning of this great speech, which is more of a sermon than a speech? To this we are witnesses. To this we are witnesses. Because he's talking about what has happened to Jesus. And he does it in sort of harsh language, doesn't he? He says, this is the one that you all murdered. You, you asked for a murderer and you killed the author of life. Pretty bold words, isn't it, from somebody who just a few weeks before said, I don't even know the guy. Went through last week how Peter did not have some great moments in his life where he always proclaimed Christ. But here he is saying, you wonder at this. Why do you look at us as though by our own power of piety we made him walk? Our own power meaning that they had nothing in themselves to make this man walk. Had been lame his entire life. And piety... He's talking to the Sadducees and Pharisees who are gathered. You know, piety is such a people who are pious, a little bit self-righteous in some ways. Their piety came from their adherence to the law. Now, I told you a couple weeks ago how pastors know how to name all the disciples. I didn't learn that in seminary. I learned that in Bible school. There were 12 disciples. Jesus called to help them. Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, brother, John, Philip, Thomas, Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon, Judas, and Bartholomew. Now, one of the things that Peter did when he spoke was he annoyed the Sadducees. I love that. He annoyed the Sadducees. He pokes them with a sharp stick, being the resurrection. Sadducees and Pharisees did not get along unless they were beating up on Jesus. You know how it says, politics make strange bedfellows, or the friend of my friend is my friend, the and friend of my enemy is my enemy. Well, the Sadducees and Pharisees were in very much disagreement over one thing, the resurrection from the dead. You want to remember how they did it, it's because, which side is which, the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, that's why they're sad, you see? That's what I learned in seminary, I didn't learn that when I was a kid. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, and here they are proclaiming this man raised from the dead. If you are an, a devout Jew, and they were devout Jews like the Pharisees, but they were very much in disagreement over this, the Pharisees believed that there was a bodily resurrection at some point, in the future, they didn't believe it was Jesus being the Messiah. But the Sadducees were so horrified by just the thought of resurrection. It was one of those ugh, ugh, ugh things. Now, when I taught Bible school years ago, this girl, she's so tired of me. She said, when are you going to stop telling this story about me, Pastor Terry? I said, probably when I'm dead or retired. I don't appreciate it anymore. She's a little girl. She was in the second grade then. No, she wasn't even in second grade. This is when she was in kindergarten. When she was in second grade, she said crazier stuff than this at Bible school. But we're talking about, at Bible school one night, you always do the crucifixion and the resurrection. And we're going to do that this year. And the stories of Peter denying Jesus and then Jesus cooking for him on the beach. But we were, so I said, you know, I was the storyteller that year, and I said, there's a really sad story in the Bible. She said, I know what it is. I'm going to tell it. It's a kindergarten student. And you're like, okay, tell it. She said, well took Jesus and they made him hurt really bad. They hit him and things like that. And then you know what they did? They nailed him to a big X. Died there. 
we're all just enraptured by this little kid who's got this story going on. So then they took him off the X and they put him in a hole and they put a rock over the hole so he couldn't get out of the hole. Three days later they looked and he wasn't in the hole anymore. It was Easter and that's how Jesus became a vampire. No, it was a zombie, I'm sorry. That's how Jesus became a zombie. That's what the Sadducees thought they were talking about. You know, these undead people walking around. They thought it was disgusting. They hated the idea of it, and it annoys them. that Here's Peter proclaiming Jesus being raised from the dead. So why isn't Peter afraid anymore? I mean, because he's really getting in their face, isn't he? This is the one that you put to death. This is the one that you changed for Barabbas, the murderer. You killed the author of life, whom God raised from the dead. Now, if you're one of those anti-resurrection people, you really are sick at this point. What do they do? They put him in jail overnight for his preaching. I've never been arrested for my preaching. I was arrested protesting apartheid once, but not for my preaching. Never been put in jail for that. But he's arrested on the basis of a sermon. That must have been some sermon. There are people who wanted to stone pastors to death after sermons, I hear. But they arrest him and put him in jail for this. Why? He's still only saying the truth of God. They don't want to hear it because they have their own piety. That's where their power comes from, their piety, their understanding of who God is, their adherence to the law, their adherence to the written word, not the living God of Jacob, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the one that Peter's proclaiming. And he said, God sent him to you, to us, and you rejected him and you had him killed. And they put him in jail for that. I think too many Christians, I've said this so many times through the years, too many Christians wait till they're dead to experience resurrection. You know what I mean? Experience new life. You don't have to wait till you're dead to experience new life. The moment you accept Christ as your Savior, the moment you open yourself to the power of the Holy Spirit, your life changes once and for all, forever. Sometimes we expect these big technicolor miracles. It doesn't always happen that way. The time that I really feel like I had this moment of extreme grace was the night before I had surgery. I had my ovary removed when I was 16 years old and two-thirds of the other one, so I could never have children, but I lived. The doctor told my parents, said, you know, the surgery's not dangerous, but the anesthesia could kill her because I'd had rheumatic fever just a few months before. My parents left the hospital that night, and I thought, you know, as I watched them walk away, my mother's crying, and she may never see me again. And I prayed that night. I said, God, if you're there, I expect you to come and make me feel better, please. I expected a little bit of, you know, Cecil would be to mill. I expected the Red Sea to part, God to come down with trumpets, angels, anything. Nothing like that happened. I was a little disappointed, but I woke up the next morning, and I knew that whatever happened, everything was okay. I had a confidence and assurance I'd never had before in my life. At that moment, I felt the power of the Holy Spirit take hold of my heart, and everything was going to be okay. I nearly did die from the anesthesia. I didn't wake up for about the next two days. But finally I woke up and I went home and I knew everything was going to be all right. I couldn't have kids, but God gave me all of you to be my children. Bill Brown is my child. I had many children through the years, and I rejoice every time one of you has a baby. I'm looking at Rachel right now, back there, getting ready to become a mom for the first time. Christ can do these things for us. You don't have to wait till you're dead to be experiencing the new life that Christ gives you. Too often we keep thinking about resurrection as often in the future, and that bodily resurrection will happen in the future. We will be together with those we love. We have so many people grieving in this congregation right now. We had so much loss in the last year. I just lost my mother last about four or five weeks ago. But we'll see her again. We'll see See all your loved ones again one day. But until then, we've got to claim the new life that Christ offers us now. That means we've got to tell somebody that Jesus is alive. Tell somebody about the power of the Holy Spirit. Do you know how many calls I got this week telling me that Sheets had gasoline for $17.76? $1.776 a gallon this week on the 4th of July. Do you know how many calls I got? I got like 16 phone calls. Does anybody of you ever get those phone calls? People will call you and tell you where gasoline is cheap, but they will not tell you where to find the author of life. People will call and tell you where to eat when you go to the beach. This restaurant is so good, I can't believe how good the food is or where the crab cakes are the best. Harry's got to sign up, best crab cakes in Maryland. 
Go to the corner's table. What do they have on their sign? Best ribs. One more best ribs. Somebody will say, where do I go for ribs? Oh, you go here. But where do I go when I need Christ? Where do I go when I need hope? Where do I go when I need help? Where do I go when I need power in my life? Where do I go when I feel like I can't keep going on? Nobody ever says, well, come to church. Because we're too busy telling them where to get ribs and gasoline and crab cakes. Got to get better at telling people where to come for grace. Come to me, Jesus said. That applies to each one of us. Come to me if you've been beaten up by the world. Come to me if you've been hurt. Come to me if people have made you feel like you're not worth anything. Come to me and I'll take you to Jesus because Jesus lives and works through me. So we got to start telling people the story of God's good news in Jesus Christ. Now, you might get arrested. That's the thing. You might get arrested. I said I was arrested before earlier. Some of you caught that. I was arrested when I was in seminary, protesting apartheid when Nelson Mandela was still in prison. I didn't want to be arrested. I was going to go down and pray for my boyfriend who was getting arrested, and I was going to stand on the other side of the street and pray for him, and God called me a wimp. I did not know God knew the word wimp. God said, okay, wimp, pray for somebody or take a stand for yourself. And said, I went across the street, and I was arrested. I've told that story before where my mother said, nice people don't get arrested. That Jesus was arrested, and my mother said, I was not his mother, was I? Mm-hmm. You might get arrested. You might get told to shut up. You might get told to stop talking. You might get told you're crazy, but still proclaim Christ. Proclaim his truth. Tell people that there is hope for them in this life. Tell people that there's hope for the world. Baltimore had a big shooting last week. And that was not the only city in the nation that had a mass shooting on that day, or the 4th of July, when people go out and look for people just to terrorize. We've got to give people another side of the story, which is hope and life and peace in Christ. Nobody's going to tell them if you don't. You may annoy somebody. I've annoyed a lot of people. I've annoyed probably some people. Raise your hand if I've annoyed you at some point in this last four years. The lampers on their lap. I remember if I annoyed you, dear. Probably. But you got to talk about your faith. If you want anybody to listen, you got to talk about it in ways that are real, that touch people's hearts, because otherwise the world does not know Jesus Christ. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Most people under 40 have not been in a building that looks like this ever in their lives. Do you know what VBS is? VBS is the chance we have to reach another generation. I've done so many weddings through the years, I don't even know how many weddings I've done, and people will say to me, I didn't grow up in the church, I'll ask them about their faith. I grew up in the church, but my neighbor used to take me to Bible school every year, and I loved Bible school. You could be that neighbor. You could be the person who invites somebody and brings them along with you. You could be the person who introduces someone to their Savior, but you've got to open your mouth and talk about him. Now look at the end of this story that we just read. Oh, we do have that second to last line. So they arrested them put them in custody until the next day before it was already evening. But many of those who heard the word believed, and they numbered about 5,000. There are people who will laugh at you if you tell them about grace, if you tell them about Christ, if you tell them about the power of the Holy Spirit, but there are people who need that. They're hungry for it. Feed them. Give them what you have. Give them Christ. Give them the Spirit. Don't make Pentecost a one time a year where you get out the red shoes and dust them off and put them on and wear them into the buildings. Carry the Spirit of Christ with you everywhere you go, and the world will change. Slowly but surely it will change because the Spirit has the power to do this in all things. uh, Other things in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. I asked Lambert to sing after the service, after the sermon today, because the song is about coming out of our graves. I want you to listen to the words.